Uh, thanks. <clears throat> um, and thanks uh, for the, to the organizers for asking me to speak. Um, so the previous two talks of today were about meta-algorithms in some sense, and this is a very much a, a traditional algorithms question, and a very old one, sort of an obsession of mine. Um, and um, I should also say, um, some subset of you have heard a version of this talk before. Um, it's similar to the one that you've seen. There's something new in the middle that I stuck in there that I hope you'll find interesting. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, OK, so uh, this is the, the problem. We're interested in multiplying n by n matrices. I'll sort of draw the picture this way on many of the slides, so I just get used to it here. Uh, these are n by n matrices with, let's say, complex uh, entries. And as we all know, it takes n cubed operations to do this in the standard way. Strassen discovered that you can do faster than that in 1969, and that set off this uh, a, a race to try to find the, to determine the exponent of matrix multiplication, omega, the smallest number, uh, real number, such that you can do uh, n by n matrix multiplication in about n to the omega operations. Um, and um, uh, so we all know that, so in these terms, in terms of omega, the standard algorithm shows that omega is less than or equal to 3. That's not very exciting. Strassen showed that it's less than 2.81. And then there's a whole sequence of further improvements that uh, some of them made uh, sort of large improvements. And in the last several years, there's been a resurgence of, of sort of um, imp small improvements over the coppersmith Winograd, uh, 2.375 or so, which had stood for a long time. And Virginia, of course, is one of those uh, who's really pushing that forward. Um, and in this talk, uh, what I'd like to do is to try to give you um, uh, a very quick summary of the sort of ideas that went into the work starting from the very beginning leading up to the present day. Um, I certainly won't do justice to Virginia's work and, and the most recent things, but I'll give you a sense of what was going on there, I hope. Um, and then I'd like to spend the second part of the talk talking about our approach, one that was developed with a whole list of uh, co-authors uh, that I listed on the first slide. Um, which works, I think, in a quite different way by embedding the problem into uh, semi-simple algebra multiplication. Uh, there is interesting group theory, and there's connection to uh, association schemes and coherent configurations, and I'll try to give you a sense of what the uh, ideas are there. So that's my plan. Um, so let me just start at the very beginning, um, just to sort of set the stage uh, with one, uh, a couple of slides, just point out that this is really a question about tensor rank, which many of you know. Um, so we can talk about the bilinear, uh, a bilinear computation of complexity m, uh, which would be, in the case of matrix multiplication, taking uh, m different products of the form some linear combination of the entries of A times some linear combination of the entries of B. Um, and of course, Strassen's algorithm fits that framework. The standard matrix multiplication algorithm fits that framework. And it's a very natural way to try to compute a matrix product, because it is a bilinear a collection of bilinear forms, after all. OK, and then you take the result to be linear combinations of these products. So this is a, what we would call a bilinear computation. And you would measure its complexity by the number of multiplications. Okay. Um, and as many of you know, uh, when you express things this way, the, an exactly equivalent uh, uh, question is, what is the rank of, matrix multiplication, of the ra matrix multiplication tensor? Um, I'll say exactly what the matrix multiplication tensor is in a moment. We label it with this little uh, notation here. Um, but to say that the rank is at most m is the same thing as saying that you have a very a bilinear computation of complexity m, so m multiplications. Um, now, some of you are probably thinking, and sort of a very natural thing, at least for this uh, uh, crowd to think about when you're asking this question, is do we really need to be doing bilinear computations uh, to solve this problem? I mean, this is an arithmetic problem. We should think about arithmetic circuits. Maybe there's weird cancellations. Why should I only do quadratic computations and so on? Right. And the nice thing about this particular problem is that Strassen showed uh, uh, a long time ago that you can assume that it's bilinear without loss of generality. In other words, if you define omega to be what you and I, well, many people in this audience, might consider to be a natural uh, measure, which is the uh, smallest exponent such that you have an arithmetic circuit that computes uh, n by n matrix multiplication in about n to the omega time, um, that's the same number as you get if you consider only uh, bilinear computations of this form, or equivalently, the rank of the matrix multiplication tensor. And that's the reason why I think it's become a very appealing problem from a mathematical perspective, because we're really asking a question about tensor rank without loss of generality. OK, so I just did that to sort of set the stage and to um, um, sort of excuse why we are always talking about tensors. It really is without loss of generality. Uh, of course, ten so now tensors, uh, for the purpose of this talk, a 3D array of complex numbers, and I'll draw it this way on many of the slides. Of course, you can have more than three dimensions tensors and so on, but that's what's relevant for the discussion about matrix multiplication. 
Uh, and what is a rank one tensor? As you all know, it's uh, a, a tensor which uh, has its i, j, k entry, the product of an x, i, y, j, and z, k, given three vectors, x, y, and z. And if you'd like to label the uh, um, uh, cube that way, that's somehow a good way to think of it. So that's a rank one tensor. Um, and a rank R tensor is a tensor which is, can be expressed as the sum of rank R rank one tensors, of course. Okay. And a useful perspective that when we're thinking about uh, uh, things on the future, um, some, some of the upcoming slides, is to uh, an equivalent notion for what it means to be a rank R tensor, is that if you take um, uh, the slices, that is, if you sort of orient things and then take the um, matrices that you get by slicing uh, going back into the board, uh, then the uh, uh, all of the slices of a rank R tensor can be written as a linear combination um, uh, of R different rank 1 matrices. Okay. Uh, it has to be the same uh, R matrices for all so of the You find R rank 1 matrices, and then you say, I can write all of the slices, of which there will be many more than R of them, as linear combinations of those rank 1. Okay, so what is the matrix multiplication tensor? It's worth actually writing it down and looking at it because it's a very symmetric, very beautiful, and very concrete uh, thing to work with. It's an, uh, so we label it with this notation, angle bracket N, 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 to indicate that you're doing N by N by N by N matrix multiplication. It's an N squared by N squared by N squared tensor. Um, sometimes we'll write a tensor by expressing it by a, a trilinear form in which we have formal variables X, Y, and Z, and the coefficient on a given X, I, y, j, z, k is the coefficient that occurs in i, j, k position. And in this case, the one thing that sometimes uh, you have to make a little switch in your mind, it's natural to index the x's, y's, and z's from the matrix multiplication tensor by pairs of indices that range from between 0 and n, uh, or 1 and n. So it's this trilinear form, and I drew, drew the picture for the 2 by 2 case, because I think it's just, at least from my way of thinking, it's easy, easiest to think of these things in concrete terms. So here is the 2 by 2 matrix multiplication problem. Here is the associated 4 by 4 by 4 tensor, and I wrote it out as the four uh, different slices, each of which is a 4 by 4 matrix. Um, and um, if you associate the rows with the entries of the A matrix and the columns with the entries of the B matrix, as I've done in that first picture, um, you can actually see that the pattern of ones in each of the slices describes the bilinear form, which is each of the uh, target result matrix entries, that is to say, uh, the C11 entry is, you know, A11 times B11 plus A12 times B21, and that's captured by the coefficient 1 here on the A11 and B11 entry and the 1 here on the A12 and the B21 entry. And in general, any bilinear form you can keep track of this way, and each of the slices goes through and gives you the different bilinear forms that occur in the four entries of the result matrix. So you can see there's this little pattern where the ones occur in corresponding positions, and then they sort of march through the cube uh, or, the, or the square, that, as I've sort of tried to highlight with the blue. Okay. So this is the matrix multiplication tensor. Uh, it's worth keeping in mind. Okay. In, in general, of course, if we write NMP, we mean the matrix multiplication tensor associated with N by M matrix multiplication by or N by M by M by P matrix multiplication. Uh, it's a tensor with these dimensions. It's again got the same trilinear form. And then if you draw the picture, you'll see that the um, slices, of which there are n times p of them, uh, each have this have m different rectangles sort of organized diagonally like this. And then the one marches across the different positions in the different slices correspondingly. Okay, so we're just trying to find the rank of this family of tensors. Uh, we'd like to show that it's close to n squared. Uh, unfortunately, that's a much harder thing to do than just finding the rank of, of a matrix, of course, and, and in fact, in general, a hard thing for this particular question. So let me tell you the strat sort of describe the strategies over the years <laughs> um, for upper bounding the rank of the matrix multiplication tensor. So let's start with a very simple first one, uh, which is that if you take the ith tensor power of the n by n matrix multiplication tensor, then that's the same thing as the n to the i by n to the i matrix multiplication tensor. Okay? Uh, this is analogous to the observation that we all know, that if you take a large an n to the i by n to the i matrix multiplication problem and block it into n by n matrix multiplication, um, 
then um, you have a fast way of doing n by n matrix multiplication, then you can get a fast way for doing the large one. In terms of the rank, it's this expression here, the rank of n to the i matrix multiplication is at most, uh, the rank of n by n matrix multiplication raised to the i. And so a strategy that this suggests is you should just find the rank for some small n by hand. And of course, this is what Strassen did when he found that two by two matrix multiplication can be done with seven multiplications instead of eight. He gets, that yields a bound of uh, omegas less than 2.81. So then you say, well, that's a great strategy. Let's work on three by three. And but for three by three, we actually don't know the answer. It's somewhere between, uh, we have a lower bound of 19 and we have an upper bound of 23. Um, unfortunately, that already gives a worse bound than uh, the 2.81. Um, and uh, at this point, it's worth pointing out another natural question is, well, by now, shouldn't we be able to do computer searches? And the computer search without further information or symmetries or cleverness is really infeasible. If you think about a three by three case, for example, then you have a nine by nine uh, tensor and you have uh, nine by nine by nine tensor. And even if you're looking for zero one uh, decompositions of it into uh, low rank tensors, it's sort of a prohibitively large uh, search space. Not to say that you couldn't do something clever, but this seems to be where things are stuck in this way. Now, a really important uh, advance came with this notion of border rank. So you can talk about the rank of a sequence of tensors that approach the target tensor entry-wise, okay? uh, uh, instead of the uh, rank, just the rank, ordinary rank of a tensor. And it's actually uh, can be smaller than the ordinary rank. Here's the sort of very simple example. So if you take, uh, if you forget this epsilon for a moment, and you look at this two by two by two tensor, whose two slices are represented here, you can show that it has rank three. Okay, that's not hard to do. Um, if you allow an epsilon here, where epsilon is going to zero, that's a sequence of tensors that approaches that target tensor. And that has rank, when you allow that epsilon, has rank two, because you this is a rank one tensor here, if you think about it. And this is a rank one tensor, and you can take a linear combination of these to get these two slices. This, this is, in fact, the first slice. And if you take this uh, slice, you know, uh, uh, minus epsilon inverse times this slice, I guess, you get the second slice. So that's border rank two, so there's a separation. Um, and you can search for uh, um, a board, uh, um, uh, n by n matrix multiplication algorithms with small border rank. And the reason this is beneficial is there's this amazing theorem that shows that if you can prove that the border rank is less than r, then you get a bound on omega, which is basically the same, this is exactly the same, in fact, as what you would get if you proved an ordinary uh, bound on the rank of r. Uh, so finding border rank bounds is just as good as finding bounds on the uh, ordinary rank of matrix multiplication. Is it the same n or is it in a limit? It's in a, uh, yes, so when I say omega is less than this, I mean omega, which is defined, of course, for a growing n. And indeed, it's the same n on the left and the right. Uh, but the actual um, uh, matrix multiplication instance for which you will realize this improved bound on, um, uh, based on the border rank, of course, is large because you have to do some, there's some machinery involved, uh, very simple machinery, but uh, some nonetheless. And, there are, and this already led to an improvement. So uh, Beanie, I believe it all, in the uh, late 70s showed that the border rank of two by two by two by three matrix multiplication is at most 10. Uh, and if you plug that in, you get that omega is less than 2.79, it's a little better than Strassen. And in fact, this idea of border rank played a role in a lot of the future maybe all the future uh, sort of uh, improvements in the sequence, um, starting with Strassen, that I'm trying to summarize now very quickly. Uh, the other really important uh, observation uh, or sort of generalization of the game uh, came with this notion of direct sum of tensors. So another strategy is that you can try to um, think about um, independent matrix multiplication. So you can think about doing an n by n matrix multiplication and an m by m matrix multiplication in parallel at once. So that is to say you take linear combinations of all of the entries of the two input matrices, uh, the n by n and the n by m, the linear combinations of the other two matrices, you do some combination of them, take some combination of the uh, take, do some multiplications, take combination of the result, and get all the answers to the two instances at once. So it's like matrix multiplication in parallel. So strategy three is to bound the, now we're allowed to say border rank, of the direct sum of small matrix multiplication tensors. Can you do lots of independent matrix multiplications uh, in better than the sort of trivial way. Um, and there's this wonderful theorem uh, uh, called the asymptotic sum inequality, of which I've written just a special case here, which says that if you can do, if you get a bound on the rank of lots of independent matrix multiplications, then you get 
this kind of inequality that ni, the sum of ni is to the omega is less than r. If you had a single matrix multiplication, you would get this kind of inequality, and that leads to that log base n of r uh, bound on the exponent. Here you get to sum them together, and that gives you an improvement, potentially, because the left-hand side is larger. So in some sense, this thing says that you don't save by doing direct sums, that in some sense... Uh, don't, no, if you can improve, uh, no, I think you're reading it maybe if, it, if the... If, the, if, the if, if you have an algorithm that takes our products, uh, then in some sense, uh, it, it means that... Uh, it means that uh, you could have just spent the complexity, you could have just uh, done everything uh, separately. No, uh, it doesn't say that. In fact, um, we'll, we'll see an example in which the R that you achieve here is better than what you would get for each of these separately and then summing them together. Uh, and that improvement is exactly what this, what yields a better uh, result here than doing each of the separate things and seeing what the best one of those would get, uh, bound would, would be from each one of those separately. Let me show you the example and then ask the question. Separately, don't you get some ni to the omega? But by convexity, the best one individual one of those would be a good, as good of a bound on omega as you would have had by doing them all together. But if you can save more than the sum by doing them all together, then you get a better bound. Ask it again if it's not clear after the example. So uh, this is the asymptotic sum inequality proved by Schoenhaga uh, in the 80s. Um, and the example, which led to actually quite a big improvement, is this one. So the border rank of doing, if you have to sort of de uh, decode these uh, expressions here. So this is the um, four, by three, uh, 4 by 3 outer product together with a inner product of vectors of length 6. So doing those two things together cost you only 13 multiplications. Now the way to just sort of, observe, real, sort of appreciate why this is significant is that if you were doing just this, the outer product of a four, length four vector by a length three vector, that costs you 12 multiplications. There's no other way to do that. That's a lower bound. So for one extra multiplication, if you'd like to think of things that way, you get to do an inner product of length six. So somehow com uh, combining these things together gives you an improvement. And that, by plugging into the theorem, gives an omega, a bound on omega of 2.55. So this is the direct sum of tensors. And then we move to strategy four, uh, uh, which is called the laser method. It's a, um, a well-named method, uh, mainly because it sounds really impressive. And, um, uh, so this is also due to Strassen. So this is n now gets to the point where I'm not going to be able to give you at all of a, a complete account of this. But it's, uh, the idea is to look at tensors that are not matrix multiplication tensors at all, or direct sums of them. Uh, but tensors that have the coarse structure of matrix multiplication and whose fine structure components are each multiplication matrix multiplication tensors, but not necessarily in a compatible way. If you have something like that, then there's a mechanism by which you can find many independent matrix multiplications by looking at a high tensor power. Okay. And I'll show you the example which actually leads to the improvement. It's actually, uh, again, something that you can really write down on the slide and look at in a very concrete way. Um, so this is, these are the slices. Um, there are q plus 1 slices, uh, sorry, q slices. Uh, they're q by 1 by q by 1. Um, and you can see there's a 1 in corresponding uh, corners, and then the, the 1 sort of marches uh, in corresponding positions along the top and up the side. Um, so that gives you the q different slices. Um, so that is a tensor. Uh, it happens to have, um, uh, let's see, I'm going to say here, border rank q plus 1. Uh, but, and it has uh, the coarse structure of a 1 by 2 by 1 matrix multiplication, which looks a little bit like this. You can sort of see how the pink regions have that form. And the fine structure looks like a scalar times a row vector for this one and a row column vector times a scalar for this one. Uh, the details of that are sort of, sort of extracting that from the picture are not so important except to point out that this has this kind of uh, feature that we were describing. Like I said, the border rank of this can be shown to be q plus 1. Again, something you can sit down by hand and, and work out. Um, and you optimize and find that q equals to 5 is best for once you plug it through the machinery. And this yields a bound on omega of 2.48, the laser method. And then Coppersmith, Winograd, and beyond, and with apologies to Virginia and the other authors who worked on this, I'm going to do this in sort of a quick way. Uh, Coppersmith, Winograd, and beyond. So they looked at the border rank of a tensor which can be expressed, I'm no longer drawing it, but it's written in this trilinear form here. There's sort of six sort of pieces of this tensor, if you will. Uh, it has a parameter q, just like the Strassen tensor had. 
And this tensor has border rank Q plus 2. That's not significant or exciting in any way, except once you realize that there's sort of machinery that you can layer on top of this, which allows you to take, again, giant tensor powers and find in those large tensor powers many independent small matrix multiplications. Now, at this point, you actually have a choice. You can sort of choose in this high tensor power what are the proportions you're shooting for for the different sort of groups of, um, of uh, coefficients. And choosing those target proportions influences both the size of the independent matrix multiplications that occur and how many of them. And you have to balance this. And if you do that and optimize for Q, you get that with Q equal to 6, you get a bound on omega, which is 2.388, which is a little bit better than the previous one. And then... So is it, is it the case that this thing, I, just very superficially, the best thing it could do is save a factor of 6 uh, on the number of multiplications? No. Uh, uh, a factor of 6 on the number of multiplications when the number of multiplications is enormous is, is imperceptible in the exponent. Uh, so that's probably an indication that at this level of describing things, it, it, it um, not um, uh, able to sort of explain the machinery and how the in, how that um, choice of target proportions affects things. But, yeah. um, but so this is a so this is the tensor which gave rise to. Um, okay, so copper smith winning ground and beyond again. This is I guess second slide of this uh, analyzed tensor powers of this tensor. So you get a nice bound by looking at just this tensor. Then you can look at the square of this tensor. It has six squared pieces, if you would adopt my sort of, sort of hand-wavy notation. Um, and you separately optimize the proportions of all of those, and you get the bound, which stood for some number of 20 years or so, of 2.375 of Copper, Smith, and Winograd. And then if you look at the fourth tensor power, something that people only took up in the recent uh, last several years, uh, it turns out you can do a little bit better. Okay, and, you, and then if you analyze the eighth power, you can do a little bit better. And uh, the sixteenth power, a little bit better and a little bit better. And as you can see, the number of pieces gets to be enormous. You have to use a computer search to do this. I'm brushing under the rug lots of uh, innovation, sort of cleverness in the way that you do the computer search and the way that you choose, use symmetries and sort of build on each successive one to con uh, construct the, pre the next proportions and so on. Um, so there's the sequence of improvements. And then there's a paper by Ambanus, Filmus, and Legal, which showed that the nth tensor power of this can't beat some number, which I hope I've gotten right, but it's something that's, there's still some room for improvement, but it won't go all the way to 2, okay? which I think confirmed many of, I mean, if you extrapolate from these numbers, it feels like there's diminishing returns. Uh, and uh, so, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm giving short shrift to this. And uh, if Virginia were to give the talk, I think there's some ways that she's thinking of and other people are thinking of maybe that might get around this um, barrier. So it remains to be seen. So you don't suggest in the paper some ways. To yeah, there's a way, I mean, it, it relies on some specific features of the way this tensor works. Uh, so maybe it's not the end of the line for that uh, approach. But <laughs> um, uh, I would like to advocate or at least uh, tell you about a different approach um, and one that I feel gets a little bit beyond some of the limitations of the sequence that I've tried to describe. So, so far, the strategy has been to bound the border rank of some small tensor by hand and then use some machinery to build, get an asymptotic bound from high tensor powers. And the machinery is potentially very sophisticated, but in the end, you start with some fixed finite tensor that you can write down uh, you know, it's 6 by 6 by 5 or something like that, and you write down on a piece of paper, and you find a bound on the border rank, which is non-trivial, decomposition that's non-trivial, and you work from there. Um, so a disadvantage is that there's sort of a limited universe of starting tensors. There's the matrix multiplication tensors, there's direct sums of them, there's the Strassen tensor, there's the coppersmith winograd tensor, and they all have ways in which they work nicely with the machinery, but somehow there's always this, like, starting point that you have to start with, and we don't have many good candidates for what that could be. And the high tensor powers are hard to analyze. Um, so an approach that um, we've been developing for a while now um, has to do with embedding matrix multiplication into groups, or semi-simple algebras, more, care more appropriately. Um, and in this way, you don't have to think about f doing anything by hand with little, little tensors. You have to think about a reduction in the sense of a computer science reduction that we're used to. 
Um, and you get to ask questions that are group theoretic questions and questions about coherent configurations and association schemes that don't seem to necessarily have a uh, connection to matrix multiplication. They're asymptotic questions which we're more familiar with dealing with and you don't have to have this uh, sort of tight connection to tensors. Okay, so let me try to describe what the idea is. So we'd like, so the idea is to try to embed or reduce n by n matrix multiplication into semi-simple algebra multiplication. Now what is semi-simple algebra multiplication? Um, for the purpose of this talk, and this is only slightly uh, simplification, it's uh, <coughs> multiplication which is isomorphic to block diagonal matrix multiplication. That is, in this object which is an algebra, when you multiply two elements, that's isomorphic to, after a bit change of basis, multiplying uh, block diagonal matrices where the blocks have different sizes depending on the representation theory of the algebra. <laughs> now, at the very sort of general level, the idea uh, is that this algebra, which I'll give you an example of in a minute, should have a nice basis with some combinatorial structure or some group theoretic structure or some sort of meaning where we can pose the question of whether you can embed matrix multiplication into this algebra by asking a question that's combinatorial in nature or group theoretic in nature. Um, and then we solve that problem, we hope, and use this isomorphism or the structure of the algebra to conclude that we've reduced n by n matrix multiplication to a bunch of smaller matrix multiplications, these block sized matrix multiplications, and then recurse. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a very high level description of the strategy. I'll just remark on this slide that if the algebra is commutative, then this, these block diagonal matrices uh, are all one by one, so it's just diagonal matrix multiplication and there's no real recursion. It just reduces to a bunch of, of multiplications in the sense that we thought of back in, some of us thought of back in 1969 uh, in stress sense. So let me give you an example of an algebra by talking, uh, by talking about groups. Um, and this was really actually something that we were still thinking about and, uh, and uh, was the subject of a couple of papers and we have conjectures having to do with it and so on, but let me give you the idea here and, and one proof. Um, so if we're given a finite group, then the group algebra C of G uh, is just formal linear combinations of group elements. These A sub Gs are complex numbers. Okay, and you can add those as formal linear combinations and you can multiply them in the natural way. Uh, that is to say, you sort of do this uh, term-wise and the complex numbers multiply as complex numbers and group elements G and H there multiply according to the group multiplication law. And if you simplify things, you see that the multiplication is some kind of convolution that depends on the structure of the group. Now the structure of a group algebra is, it's a semi-simple algebra, that is to say, it's isomorphic to a bunch of matrix algebras whose sizes, whose dimensions are D1 up to DK. And those are the character degrees of the group or the dimensions of the irreducible representations of the group. And there's a whole theory that helps you understand what those are as, uh, once you know what the group is, uh, which I won't go into. Uh, but this is the um, feature that allows this to give you a reduction. Um, and the group elements in this case are the nice basis as I was trying to describe in the general framework. Um, and what do I mean by that? Uh, I mean this, that if you are asking about reducing n by n matrix multiplication to group algebra multiplication, you can do it by asking for three subsets, subgroups of the group X, Y, and Z that satisfy what are called, what's called the triple product property. That is to say, uh, if you take the product of a little x times little y times a little z and get one, you want that to happen only in the trivial way, only if X, Y, and Z are themselves one. Okay, so X, sets X, uh, sub, subgroups X, Y, and Z of, z of G satisfy the triple product property if whenever you have this little triple product being one, it happens only when all of the elements on themselves are one. And it turns out, first of all, it turns out that you have to, uh, that you can generalize this to subsets and then talk about the quotient sets of X, Y, and Z, but I encourage you to ignore that uh, detail for the moment. Um, uh, it turns out that if you have that, uh, feet, th those three subsets of the group, then there's a very natural way to perform matrix multiplication inside the group algebra. That is, you take the um, x, y entry of the A matrix and take it as the coefficient on x, y inverse, sum of all of those. You take the sum of the y, z entries of the B matrix, or the, I should say the y, z entry of the B matrix is the coefficient on y, z inverse, and then you multiply these two group algebra elements together, uh, and the claim is that you can find the x, z entry of the uh, result matrix as the coefficient on x, z inverse in the product. Okay, and the, there's a you don't have to pay attention to this, but the proof is the, sort of the one line. You just sort of work out what the multiplication is 
Um, but this is the, what I mean by a nice basis. So we're trying to embed into group algebra multiplication um, on its face. That's just saying, well, let's see if we can transform this problem one into the other. But it, the, the embedding actually is captured by something which is really a group theory question or uh, one where you really feel like you can maybe uh, uh, use ideas about groups. Uh, and then use the machinery of uh, doing multiplication, group algebra multiplication via the isomorphism to uh, uh, block diagonal matrix multiplication to actually get something out of this. Okay, so what does this actually mean in terms of the number of multiplications? Suppose you actually can do this. So embedding, as I've just described, plus the structure of the group algebra as a semi-simple algebra, yields a bound on the rank, or the number of multiplications. And what is that? Well, it's Ultimately, you do n by n matrix multiplication by embedding it into this block diagonal matrix multiplication. And you may remember that the, for the group algebra, the size of the blocks are these di's, which are the character degrees of the group. Um, and so you can say, well, how many multiplications is that? So I have to do all these di by di matrix multiplications. So if I just use the trivial uh, n cubed matrix multiplication algorithm, then you use this number of multiplications, right? the sum of the di cubed. Okay, but some of you are already sitting there saying, of course, that's not what you should do. You should use better than the trivial. We already know how to do that. Uh, and so, in fact, what we should do is do whatever the best algorithm is um, recursively. And so the real number that you use is the sum of the di's to the omega. But before we sort of go down that line, uh, road, I would just point out that omega is at least 2. <laughs> um, and so we use at least the sum of the di squared multiplications. Um, and the sum of the di squareds is the same as the size of the group because of this isomorphism. And so a challenge that's actually a worthwhile sort of way of approaching this is just can you tell me if you can embed k by k matrix multiplication into a group of size about k squared? Because if you can't, you don't, get a, you don't have a shot at getting exponent 2 from this approach. right? Now, I'm going to try to do k by k matrix multiplication in much better than k cubed, hopefully close to k squared multiplications. Since I need at least the size of the group many multiplications, I better hope to be able to do this in a group down of size of about k squared. Make sense? Okay. If you can, is it, why aren't you done? Uh, because it depends on, I'll show you the, the actual theorem in a minute, but the problem is, is that uh, the group may be small, but this di, the di's may be large. And because the actual sort of number that you use is di to the omega, for example, if one of the di's is larger than the n that you started with, you've reduced n by n matrix multiplication to a bunch of matrix multiplications, one of which is larger, and you're not making any progress. So you need the small, small representations. So there's a challenge, and one, one that you can think about. And you can show that an abelian group requires size k cubed. So you have to use non-abelian groups. That's a simple argument. Um, and in fact, we can do this. We can show this is way back in the early papers in 2003, I guess, we can embed k by k matrix multiplication into a symmetric group that has size about k squared. Um, and I'll show you the embedding, because actually the new, something that's a little bit new, a few weeks old, I wanted to mention uh, as a question actually about this particular construction. So here's a way to think of this embedding. It's actually kind of pretty. So we have n objects, which I've arranged in a triangular array like this. And Sn acts on those by permuting them. So the uh, permutations uh, <coughs> uh, permute these n elements. And we need to find three subgroups which have size about the square root. Um, and I claim that these three subgroups satisfy that. So this is subgroup x. It's those permutations of these n elements that preserve things within the red um, uh, boxes. Uh, and then the next subgroup, as you can probably guess, preserve those boxes, and the next subgroup preserves those. So that's three subgroups of the group, and you have to trust me when I sell, tell you that those three subgroups actually, if you work out Sterling approximation and so on, have size about the square root of the size of the group. Okay? But I still need to convince you that they satisfy the triple product property. So what does that mean? It means that if you first permute things, let's say, inside the blue boxes, and then permute things inside the green boxes, and then permute things inside the red boxes, and everything ends up where it started, you have to tell, you, I have to prove to you that none of those three permutations moved anything anywhere. They were all the identity. So let me do that. So I turned the triangle on its side so that we can talk about rows, columns, and diagonals. Okay. And let me prove that by looking at one point at a time. So let's look at what happens to this little corner here. 
So first thing that happens is it gets moved somewhere in its row. So imagine it moving around. And then wherever it ends up in, along that row, it then gets moved up and down in its column by the column permutation, right? But it's supposed to get back to where it started by a final diagonal permutation, and the diagonal permutation fixes this point. So you have to get back inside this box. Okay, and I think you can see from the picture that you can't have moved it all to the right or at all up if you end up back here. So this point is fixed by all three permutations. Now we think about this one. And the key thing now is that this one, the, left, to the point to its left is fixed, so it can't move left. It has to move in its row permutation, has to move somewhere to the right. And then up and down in the column. And then it has to get back inside this box to have a chance of getting back to where it started. And I think you can see again from the picture, you can't have moved it all to the right and it all up if you're going to get back to the box. And so that one's fixed. And in the same way, that's fixed, that's fixed, that's fixed. And then once the whole row is fixed, you just start repeating it for the next row and the next row. And then they're all fixed, which is what we wanted to try to show. So the triangle construction. Now, here's the, uh, so there's the theorem. And the unfortunate thing is that this relates to Boaz's question. Uh, this doesn't give you a good bound on the exponent of matrix multiplication. doesn't give you any bound at all, unfortunately, because the largest character degree for the symmetric group is unfortunately quite large. Uh, it's, in fact, even larger than the size of one of these subgroups, and so the reduction is sort of meaningless, which is unfortunate. Um, here's the actual theorem, which I think maybe some of you have been wondering about. So it says if you can, uh, in a group that has, uh, supports k by k matrix multiplication with character degrees d1, d2, d3, et cetera, the actual bound on omega you get is what's implied by this inequality, which is a very natural one. It says, well, the number of multiplications that are required to do k by k matrix multiplication, that's k to the omega, is upper bounded by, well, you were just did a reduction, so it's the number of multiplications required to do the d by d, d the di blocked matrix multiplication, the sum of the di's to the omega. And then you can see there that if the di's are large relative to k, then you don't get any kind of a bound. Um, so here's one way to sort of, um, uh, sort of get more of a handle on what you should be aiming for. You want x, y, and z, the subsets of the group that satisfy the triple product property, and uh, k, the size of the matrix multiplication instance that they support, which is, if you want to be very careful, the geometric mean of x, y, and z, uh, should be approaching the size of the group, uh, square root of the size of the group. That was our goal that we stated before, right? Okay, and you would like that the maximum character degree is bounded away from the size of the group, uh, square root of the size of the group, by a constant in the exponent. Now, the largest that d, can, d max can ever be is the square root of the size of the group. So you're asking, just because the sum of the di squareds is equal to the size of the group, you're asking for a little bit better than that. And if you can do that simultaneously with having this very good embedding, like the one that we just did for the symmetric group, then you get actually omega is equal to 2. Okay, so I'm, of course, deliberately presenting it in a way that makes it seem like it's right around the corner. That seems to be a hard thing to get those combination of things. Um, but that's some way of understanding what you should be shooting for. And then there's the... Here's the thing that's actually, um, we sort of just noticed a, a few weeks ago. Um, so this symmetric group, this triangle construction, I told you it's worthless because the largest character degree is larger than the size of the subgroup that I just described. But it turns out that the shape of a triangle is not the best one. So here's a picture of the triangle of 30, with n equal to 36. So the size of the group is 36 factorial. The size of each of the three subgroups is, you know, they're, you know, 1 factorial times 2 factorial times 3 factorial, et cetera, up to 8 factorial, okay? And just to keep track of things, I tr computed the log of the size of the group because it's a large number, and it's whatever it is, some number. If you take the triangle, make it a little rounder, then you get subgroups who have size, you know, 3 factorial, 4 times 4 factorial times 5 factorial, et cetera, like that. And that number, that log, that subgroup is a little bit larger. So actually, it's possible at the moment uh, that by choosing the shape to be different than a triangle and in some way the best possible shape, that you can actually push the sizes of these subgroups to be so, they're all approaching the square root of the size of the group, but they may actually approach the square root of the size of the group fast enough that they overtake the largest character degree. And in fact, this construction potentially could give you exponent 2 uh, as a question we're thinking about now. But it's sort of a funny, the triangle construction is always a nice proof. And 
see on the slide, and you can probably all understand it. And then the question is, well, find the best shape. It's not a triangle, actually. Does it give you anything better than a three? This doesn't give you anything. It, this is so we're talking about the rate at which we approach the square root of the size of the group, and one of the rate one of them has to approach the square root of the size of the group faster than the other. So it's only going to give it sort of um, how shall I say this? Once one approaches faster than the other, then you get exponent two. <laughs> And before that, you get nothing. So it's, a, it's all or nothing. <coughs> it's a tall order, but it's nonetheless something that I guess we don't really know the full answer to. The, the order, which shape satisfies the triple product? That's order. right. You have to axiomatize how that proof works. And uh, it, um, it turns out that you can do that. And you're sort of really looking for a surface. And then you slice it by the x, y, and z axes. and then. Um, can they, I mean, so it really is, becomes a question about shape. I, I'll just say that like a, a, an even simpler question is can you find two subgroups whose intersection is only the identity that are young subgroups of the symmetric group, that is to say they're just given by these partitions, uh, that are where the partitions are transverse to each other, which is what you need for the intersection to be the identity, such that their size is large enough that it would yield this kind of a um, result, and we don't know the answer to that. OK, so that <clears throat> I wanted to uh, just mention, because I think it's kind of a quite cool question to think about. Let me just quick sort of summarize where things uh, can go from there. And maybe I'll go five minutes over. That's OK to the chair. Um, <laughs> so, um, so in other groups that are weak product groups, we've gotten bounds that are um, not better than the best known bounds, but are significant I mean, nice bounds. Uh, the key part of each of those constructions is combinatorial. Uh, each of those combinatorial constructions comes with an associated conjecture, which seems, at least to us, to be pretty natural, which would imply omega is equal to 2. I'm not going to talk about those conjectures because I don't have time. Uh, the disadvantages are that uh, non-trivial results in this setting require non-abelian groups, as I mentioned very briefly at the beginning. And it seems, from our experience, that most of the ideas that you have are foiled by too large character degrees. So you get a nice construction, then you go look at the representation theory of the group, and it turns out to be too, the character degrees are too large. So there's a tension between those two quantities. Um, so this generalization that we've been thinking about most recently gets around that. And I'll just say enough of the generalization to sort of give you a sense of why it can get around that. So I, I started out by saying, oh, this is an approach about embedding into semi-simple algebras. So let's just think very quickly about what that means um, in general. So a general algebra is specified by a basis. This is the one that I hope will be nice in the quotes. Um, and structure constants that tell you when you multiply basis element ei times ej, it's a linear combination of the other uh, basis elements. And these lambda ijks give you those, uh, describe the algebra completely. Okay. Um, so here's a little picture of the structural tensor of algebra multiplication. It turns out that it's just populated with those lambda ijks, if you think about it. And asking whether you can realize matrix multiplication or embed matrix multiplication or reduce matrix multiplication to this multiplica algebra multiplication is a question of whether the matrix multiplication tensor can be found inside there. Like you literally can find a piece of this uh, subcube of this cube, which contains the matrix multiplication tensor. And I put an asterisk here because contains isn't quite what you think it means. Uh, the uh, matrix multiplication tensor we know and we've looked at before uh, when you embed it into an algebra, you get a bound on the rank of a tensor which has these lambda ijks in instead of just zeros and ones, where lambda ijks are not zero. With a group algebra, it turns out that those structure constants are always zero or one. But in general, we may have an embedding in which you get a, realize a tensor which has non-zero and one, co non -one coefficients here. Um, and this is some kind of weighted form of matrix multiplication, but not one that you can unweight by just rescaling the entries. Let me give you just a very quick uh, description of what happens. So we can define the S rank of a tensor to be the minimum rank of a tensor with the same support as that tensor. Um, and the question now becomes, does a bound on the S rank of matrix multiplication tensor, tensor imply an upper bound on the ordinary rank? Because the bound on the S rank seems to be what comes out of this more general setting. And here, just to make it concrete, here's the two by two matrix multiplication that we know and love. Here are the results. Okay, and, and we know how to do this, I guess, with seven multiplications, thanks to Strassen. So here's a question. If I had a way of computing this, these four result entries, but there was a two in, in place of this one uh, product, okay. if I could do that in six, let's say, does that give you anything? 
Does that turn into any kind of multiplication algorithm for matrix multiplication? You see, you can't get rid of this too by just rescaling the A matrix. Because if you rescale that entry, then you mess up this one. And you can't get it by rescaling the B matrix, because that would mess up some other entries. There's no simple answer to that question. Um, we can even define the S rank version of the matrix multiplication uh, exponent. And the theorem that we prove in the 2012 paper is that, in fact, you can get a bound on omega from a bound on the uh, omega sub s, that is a bound, uh, exponent describing the um, uh, best rank of a tensor with the same support. Uh, it has a little linear transformation. The key thing to notice is that when omega sub s approaches 2, then omega approaches 2. So if you get exponent 2 for the support uh, rank notion, then you get exponent 2 for omega. So this really justifies our ability, it allows us to think about trying to embed into general semi-simple algebras. Uh, now, uh, coherent configurations and association schemes are th sometimes called group theory without groups. I'm out of time, so I'm not going to go into the whole uh, description of them, except to say that uh, they capture lots of neat uh, objects in algebraic combinatorics um, that are more general than groups. You can express something like the triple product property for these guys and talk about embedding matrix multiplication into them. And let me just get to the, let me just sort of skip to the, um, and there's a semi simple algebra associated with them. It's called the adjacency algebra. Um, let me skip to the um, punchline, which is this. So in the case of groups, non-commutative groups were necessary, and that really was hard to work with because we kept having to deal with large character degrees. We had to understand representation theory and all these kinds of things. So we needed to get an embedding into a small group and have small character degrees at the same time, and those were um, two goals that seemed in tension with one another. What we can show in the coherent configuration framework uh, is that commutative um, algebras suffice. Um, we have constructions that are based on the old constructions that sh prove that you can realize non-trivial bounds on omega uh, in commutative, uh, very simple varieties of co coherent configurations, uh, which I didn't get a chance to tell you what they are. Um, and the conjectures that, from the old setting, if true, would imply um, omega sub s is equal to 2, even in this commutative coherent configuration setting. So the punchline is that you can and should try to embed n by n matrix multiplication into a commutative coherent configuration. It's an object that generalizes groups of rank about n squared. And if you can do that, if you can do the analog of that triangle construction I showed you at the beginning, then you're done. There's no further discussion of representation theory. Uh, and here are my uh, open problems. So find the best shape and place of the triangle. A crazy question that we didn't realize was even open until recently. Uh, find a construction in the new framework that proves some non-trivial bound on omega that's not based on construction in the old setting. One of the frustrating things about what we currently know about the coherent configurations still seems to rely on the stuff we did with groups. Um, is the border rank, border S rank, for example, of two by two matrix multiplication six instead of seven? A question we don't know the answer to. Or find an example where border S rank really helps you with a matrix multiplication tensor. And in general, can you do this reduction of matrix multiplication into commutative coherent configurations, which have rank about n squared? And if you do that, you get omega equal to two. Thanks, and sorry for going over. I seem to remember there was some paper claiming that some of these conjectures are in conflict with some other conjectures. So, so yes, uh, right. So we have a paper that, yeah. So there's a paper called uh, uh, Sunflowers and Matrix Multiplication with uh, Nogalon and Amir Spilka. Um, so, um, the, uh, there are two main conjectures that I didn't describe in detail that are sort of combinatorial in nature. One of them contradicts a non-standard version of the uh, of sunflower conjecture. Um, one where I think it, it's a sort of multicolored version of this capset conjecture in Z3, which many people know and, and like in our community. That conjecture, it, Sort of like if you ask people, it's like 50-50 whether they think it's true or not. And then the non-standard version of it is even less likely to be true. But it is a warning sign that perhaps that conjecture is not true. The other, that the um, uh, combinatorial conjecture may not be true. Uh, so that's the connection. The other combinatorial conjecture, as far as we know, is unrelated to sunflowers. So the, actually, two questions. So one is that. Uh, you talked about the computer search and uh, how it can be speed up by looking for symmetries. Uh, the structured solution and some of the other solutions have symmetries. So 
there uh, imposing the symmetry condition on the original tensor or on your approach from the, uh, the group algebra approach? There's sim there's yeah there's symmetries everywhere of course because we're talking about groups that, and um, uh, people have actually really proved things about uh, you know, um, about that um, I don't know of a way in which that significantly impacts the uh, speed of a computer search we actually spent a fair amount of time noticing that some of the um, low rank um, decompositions can be found as a single orbit of some group action, and so the, if that were really true, if we could have proved that, then that would speed up the search, but we don't know. I think we found counterexamples to that. Right, uh, so, I mean, this is a, like a wide open question, and I don't know of a concrete answer where it either helped or whether we can prove a lower bound, but we thought about it, and other people have. And the other question I was curious about is just, we are looking, we have three dimensional tensors, we are looking for linear upper bounds of the ring, or near linear upper bounds. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. This happens to be the matrix multiplication one, we don't know. Uh, convolution, we do know it's near linear. That's a four year. Yeah. Are there any, uh, just other examples where you have near linear upper bounds that are sort of interesting? That are substantially different. I think you know a lot of the interesting yeah. examples come from algebra multiplication, where it really is a question about matrix multiplication. You know that there's a okay. This is not a, quite an answer to your question, but there's this far-reaching stress and conjecture that uh, that perhaps an upper bound on the asymptotic rank of any three-dimensional tensor is actually linear, just the side length, the largest side length, the asymptotic rank. So when you take large asymptotic powers. So that's something we don't even know how to refute that. And if that were true, of course, the matrix multiplication exponent would be two, and everything would be as simple as possible in this so domain. Conjecture? conjecture is that if you take an n, let's just say an n by n by n tensor, any tensor, not necessarily the matrix multiplication tensor, and ask about the asymptotic rank. So as you take tensor powers of it, uh, does its um, what is, it, is its rank? You know, r to the number of power, the n, capital n. Let's say if you take n tensor power. Um, then the conjecture is that R may be actually just N for all N by N by N tensors. In other words, the structure that you start of the starting tensor is irrelevant once you look at a large asymptotic power. It's just dictated by the size. So, so in, in this kind of conjecture, it would seem that if it's false, like a random tensor would be a, a counterexample. Yeah, but you have to prove, it's hard because you have to prove a lower bound on tensor rank for some large tensor power maybe, and so, yeah. People believe that it's true or false. Like I mean, Strassen, I think, made this conjecture, and then I probably, if you ask him, he says he, he's not sure that it is really true. And I think he even wrote that in the margin of one of his papers. Maybe I'm confusing that with another story, but um, uh, I don't know. It's a depends. Depends. Depends when you ask, but yeah. Uh, but, but maybe like in the. Seems like and maybe trying to analyze a random tensor in one way or the other, after bound or low bound. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. His conjecture was that it's n or o of n. That the asymptotic rank is uh, n. And so far, you can try for two by two. Then. You can try for two by two, sure. But if you prove enough bound on the asymptotic rank of two by two matrix multiplication, you're proving a bound on matrix multiplication. Nobody knows. Yeah, nobody knows. That's right. Yeah. Thanks again.